All right, so let's go back to Lewis dot structures, and we're going to do some more practice for the start of class. So we started out yesterday with our super simple one, which was methane, and you guys got to practice a little bit more last night. But now let's get into some tricky ones, and these are ones that involve some more complicated double and triple bonds. So the first one is another really interesting molecule. It's COCl2. The name for this is phosgene. It was a war gas used in World War I. Pretty nasty stuff. It'll form hydrochloric acid in your lungs when you breathe it in and give you nasty blisters on the inside. So let's try drawing this one, and then I'll put down a couple others too. I'll give you a hint with phosgene, this first one. Carbon is going to be your central atom. One trick people like to do is they count all the valence electrons that should be in this molecule. So in this case, carbon has four. Oxygen has six. Chlorine has how many? Seven. And we've got two of them, so we'll put down 14. So we should have 24 valence electrons in phosgene. How many of you guys think you got this already? Okay, I'll give you guys a couple minutes. I'll do the valence for cyanide over here. All right, so let's start with phosgene. What I like doing is I first draw out my Lewis dot structures for the components. So we've got our central carbon. We've got our oxygen up top that has six electrons. And then we've got two chlorines. So I'll put a chlorine here. And I'll put a chlorine over here. So now we need to pair up our unpaired electrons. So I'll circle these. And we compare these two, we compare these two, we compare these two, but we're not done. What do we need to do? Yeah, we've got a double bond, it looks like, between carbon and oxygen. So we can go through and say, there must be another bond between there as well. So when we draw this, we can draw this as having a central carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And we've got chlorine coming off of both ends. And then oxygen has two lone pairs. So if you do get stuck on these, you can go super old school and draw each individual Lewis dot structure for each atom and just try to pair electrons. The key thing to remember too is you want to double check at the end to make sure that you don't have more electrons than you started with. All right, for cyanide, we've got hydrogen, which has one. And then we've got a carbon, and then we've got a nitrogen. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Carbon has four. So again, we can go through and pair these up. Let's say there's a bond here, bond here, bond up here, and a bond down there, right? So it looks like in this case, cyanide actually has a triple bond between the carbon and nitrogen. So we'll draw this one over on the right. Let me slide this over a bit. Cyanide is some pretty nasty stuff to work with. Um, you guys remember Gilbert Lewis that I was talking about yesterday? Yeah, he killed himself with cyanide. Cyanide will kill you in an instant. What it does is it will actually bind to your hemoglobin and irreversibly bind meaning when it binds there, your body can't absorb oxygen anymore and you suffocate to death. It's a pretty nasty poison. I, I chose some pretty morbid examples, and I apologize. <laughs> All right, so now let's do some more practice identifying some formal charges.
And most of you were able to figure this out on your homework, but I still wanted to clarify the rules that I like to use. So if you have a molecule and you're not sure whether or not an atom has a formal charge, you can use this simple tool where you can say the charge is equal to your valence number minus your lone pair of electrons. minus one half of your bonding electrons. So let's take some examples and I want you guys to help me identify whether or not there's a formal charge and what atom it belongs to. So down here we've got hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Got this one and then I'll put a couple more examples down as well. So in our first example, does anybody spot an atom that might have a formal charge? Oxygen. So let's go through and double check on oxygen. So if we look at oxygen, we can say, okay, oxygen has a valence number of six minus a lone pair of two electrons minus one half times how many bonding electrons? <laughs> two, four, six bonding electrons. So if we go through and do this, 6 minus 2 is 4, minus 3, we're left with a charge of positive 1, right? So in this case, we do want to specify the sign because the sign makes a big difference. So in this case, oxygen has a positive 1 charge. You can either write plus or plus 1. I'm fine with it being shown either way. What about with aluminum on the next one? It's got a valence of what normally? Three. So it's got three minus zero lone pairs, minus one half, and it's got four bonding sets, or four electrons in bonding pairs. So three minus two. Or did I mess this up? Oh, I did. I was doing math in my head before I was supposed to be doing it. We've got eight in our bonding set. Nobody yelled at me there. All right, so three minus four is negative one. There we go. So aluminum has a charge of negative one coming off of it. Make sure that you identify the specific atom that the charge belongs to. So our next example shows why this might be the case. So what charge should boron have? Negative one, right? What charge should our nitrogen have? Positive one. So you can go through and double check that if you'd like. But this is a unique example. What overall charge does the molecule have? Zero. But we still want to include the formal charges when we're drawing it out because that says a lot about the reactivity of this molecule. These are really unique molecules. And what these are called are Zwitter ions. And Zwitter ion is the chemistry term for uh, identifying a molecule that has a positive charge and a negative charge that cancel out within the same molecule. So in this case, it has both a positive and negative charge. Somebody sent me an email last night saying, well, I was taught that we should always minimize charges. You guys are going to learn a lot of the rules we taught you always have exceptions. It's kind of frustrating, but it's the way chemistry works. There are going to be exceptions to a lot of these, and we'll cover them as the term progresses. All right, let's move on to isomers. Or I guess, are there any questions with Lewis dot structures? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Zwitter ion by definition is neutral because the charges cancel. So it, like yep. it has to cancel. You can, 
Exactly. Good questions. All right, let's go on to isomers. So we talked a little bit about this with our problem of the day. And we said that isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula. but different connectivity. So I'll give you guys another problem that I want you to work on. Whoop, I forgot my why. I want you guys to determine the possible structures for this molecule, C4H10. This one's a little bit bigger. But see if you can arrange them differently from one another. They shouldn't look alike. The first one should be pretty easy. So I'll get started on the first and easy one. It's just a chain of carbon atoms, right? So we've got four carbon atoms all lined up. And then our remaining hydrogen atoms are coming off of there. This is called butane. We'll get into naming organic compounds later. Some of you may have covered it in your earlier level classes, but we'll go into it in much, much more detail. What's something we could do to connect it differently? Yeah, do kind of a T-shape. So instead of having it be a straight chain, you could say, all right, on one end we'll have carbon pointing out, so it looks a little bit like a cross or a T-shape. And they have the exact same molecular formula, right? They each have 10 hydrogens and four carbons, but they behave very differently. Butane has a boiling point of about zero degrees Celsius. The one on the right is actually called 2-methylpropane, and it has a boiling point of negative 10 degrees Celsius. So they're very, very different molecules. One thing you gotta watch out for is make sure that you draw things out completely. Because if you have something connected differently, they have different physical properties. So it's always a good idea to draw out your full structure. It takes a little bit more time, but it ensures that somebody's not interpreting your molecular formula to mean something else. All right, but there are a handful of problems with Lewis dot structures. If we're looking at C4H10, does it look exactly like that? Is it a perfectly straight line? What's usually going on in a long carbon chain? Zigzags, right? So loose dot structures are great for representing things in two dimensions, but we need to actually look at some of the deficiencies as well. So what we're gonna talk about a little bit is something called the Vesper theory. Most of you guys are probably familiar with this. And the Vesper theory addresses this problem. The problem, let's just take a simple one like methane, is if we draw our Lewis dot structure, 
it looks like these angles should be about 90 degrees, right? What should they be? Yeah, 109.5. So what we do as chemists is we try to represent this using three-dimensional space. So I'll draw one hydrogen sticking straight up. I'll draw the other one kind of diagonally out to the left. And then I'll use a wedge here. And I'll use a dash right there. So now we can kind of see that these angles more closely represent the ideal angles of 109.5 degrees. So the Vesper model is the correct version of drawing this. The Lewis dot structure is incorrect, at least in terms of three-dimensional space. So the question I have for you guys is, what does that wedge and dash mean? Yeah, a wedge means that it's coming out of the board towards your eyeball. A dash means that it's sticking into the board away from you. So if you think about this, you can look at it with a model kit. Like I said, these are really useful tools to have. So the central point is the carbon. The hydrogen is sticking up, another hydrogen is out, one sticking back, one going towards your eye. This is the more correct view of looking at a methane molecule. So we do try to draw things using wedges and dashes in order to show the absolute geometry of these molecules in space. So Vesper theory does a nice job of explaining it. Why does it adopt this conformation instead of being at 90 degrees? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. So Vesper, if you're unfamiliar with that acronym, means valence shell electron repulsion. That's a fancy way of saying electrons have the same charge. They repel each other. They want to be as far apart from each other as possible, right? So in this case, we'll just write down electrons, both lone pair and bonding. Want to be as far apart from each other as possible. How many of you guys are really familiar with Vesper theory already? All right, this is good. But what I gave you guys, just in case, is a quick handout. Did you guys see that in the back? It's a really good graphical guide for showing the shapes of molecules in three dimension. If you notice on the left-hand side, what it has is a number. What that is called is the steric number. And this tells you a lot of information about the molecule. So a steric number. equals the number of bonded atoms plus lone pairs. This tells you essentially what's going on electronically with this molecule. So if you have two bonded atoms, what would the shape be? Linear, right? There's only one option. The furthest they can get apart from each other are opposite sides. If you've got three bonded atoms, what would we call that? Trigonal planar, right? That's the furthest apart they can get from each other in space. And with four, we get into tetrahedral. Luckily, with organic chemistry, we don't really get into the higher level one. So if you want, you can just scribble out that bottom portion. If you go on to cover inorganic chemistry, you will get into steric numbers of five and six, um, but we're not going to get into that in this class. We're really only going down to tetrahedral. Make sure that you are familiar with that Vesper handout. Um, if it does sound pretty foreign to you, make sure that you review some of this older material. So if we go back and we look at these shapes, this is a really nice simplistic view of what's going on. But bonds aren't just simple like this, right? They're actually overlapping orbitals. So we want to take a look at this Vesper model using molecular orbital theory. Those of you that had Dr. Allen last year had this pounded into your head, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so we'll cover molecular orbital theory.
And molecular orbital theory sounds pretty scary, but it's not, so don't let it intimidate you. And there are a couple of things that I do want to bring back from Gen Chem. And the first is that electrons fill the lowest energy orbital first, and then they go to the highest after that. Does anybody remember the name of this principle? It starts with an A. Off bow principle. So this was brought up a lot in general chemistry. And the easiest way I remember this is I make a little chart. And I do 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s. And then I go over here and I do 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p. And then over here, I do 3d, 4d, 5d. And then you can go to 4f and then 5f. And then if we're looking at the order, we don't go down columns, which is our intuitive instinct, and we don't go left to right. What we do is we actually go diagonally. So first one we go through is the 1s orbital. That's our lowest energy orbital. Then we go over to our 2s orbital. And then we go 2p, 3s. And then 3p, 4s. And then 3d, 4p, 5s. And then 4d, 5p. 4f, 5d, and then 5f. That essentially encompasses the entire periodic table. So I'm not going to write this all out, but it's important to remember that this is the order of orbitals. Some people during the summer break take a fair amount of time taking all that gen chem information and throwing it in the garbage as they go on vacation. So we need to make sure that we remember it. So the off bow principle is a really important thing to remember. The other thing that's very important to remember is another principle called the Pauli exclusion principle. Does anybody remember what the Pauli exclusion principle states? Yeah, electrons want to be spin paired. So you want an electron going spin up and spin down. You don't usually have spin paired electrons, meaning both pointed up or both pointing down. They prefer to be spin unpaired like that. So electrons want to be paired with an electron of opposite spin. And this was our Pauli exclusion principle. So now let's practice filling in molecular orbitals for a couple different atoms. And what we're going to do, if you remember, is start from the bottom, spin pair them, go up to the next highest orbital, spin pair them, and just keep on going up. So let's start with carbon as our first one. It's the most important element. I'm going to put an energy scale on the left-hand side. And then if we're going from lowest energy orbital to highest energy, we can start filling those in and then leave them empty until we want to add electrons. So I'll say 1s. Then we've got our 2s orbital right above that. And then we've got our 2p orbitals. And I'm going to call these 2px, 2pz, and 2py, because if you remember p orbitals, they actually have different orientations, so we try to classify which orientation we're referring to. So what's the valence number on carbon? Six. It's got four, but in this case, we actually need to include all of the electrons. This 1s shell is actually our inner core electrons, so we still have to fill these out. So in this case, that's something that tricks up a lot of people is we get so used to thinking about valence electrons, but when we're drawing these out, we do need to draw all electrons. So it has six, so we go one up and then down. That's two, three, four. And then do I go five, six? 
No. This is one weird rule. We actually have to fill all orbitals and then start pairing them. So with carbon, we would have two spin up electrons or two spin down electrons. Both are equally probable. Let's do oxygen really quick. So if we look at the periodic table, we have one, two, three, four, five, oops, sorry, one, ten, two, three, four, five, six. So we want to include the inner core electrons, not just the balance electrons, the more strong molecular orbitals. Okay, and the whole pair we don't fill in all the uh, so in this case, we go one, two, three, four, and then we have to singly fill these. Yeah. And then if we wrap around, then we start pairing them. I thought that it was like Let's do another example where we'll see it slightly different. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, that's X, Z, and Y. Okay. Meaning the axes. Yeah. If you can't read my handwriting or if I'm writing too small, definitely let me know. So let's do a different one with more pairing. Let's do fluorine. They say the longer you're in school, the worse your handwriting gets. And I think I'm proof of that. In Adam's class. All right, how many electrons does fluorine have? Nine? Okay. So we'll fill it in from the bottom, and we go one, two. We've paired that energy level, so now we go up to the highest, or next highest one, three, four. And then we go five, six, seven, and then what? And then we start pairing. And again, they want to be spin opposite. So that's 8 and then 9. So does that make sense? When you're going up energy levels, you pair that energy level only when all of those orbitals are filled. So with P, you want to fill those before you start pairing them. Okay, that seems like similar when they pair them both immediately? Yeah, with 1s orbitals, if you have enough electrons, you pair them immediately. There are some weird examples in the transition metal block where that rule will sometimes not be the case, where especially with d orbitals, um, they're actually more stable as being all spin up, meaning you've got all five of the d orbitals with one electron and an s orbital with one electron. But in organic chemistry, we don't run into that very often. Yeah. All right, so if we're looking at these, we said that electrons want to be spin paired, but we've got some examples of spin unpaired electrons. Because of that, these are unstable and they want to find an electron to partner to. So these would be our not paired, meaning that they're unstable or reactive. And there are a variety of ways that we can stabilize these, right? So if we look at some really simple examples, we can just find another atom with an unpaired electron and have them come together and form a nice bonding set. So those are the really simple cases. So in simple cases, these unpaired electrons will pair with an electron from another atom to form a bonding molecular orbital. And I'm going to abbreviate molecular orbital MO. So let's take a super easy example. And in this case, our example is just hydrogen gas. So if we think about hydrogen, the Lewis dot structure, it has one valence electron. And so if we're filling in our energy orbitals, that means it has one electron and it's one s orbital. And let's say over on the other side, we've got another hydrogen atom. 
And again, it's got its one electron. That one electron is filling its one s orbital. And I'll label this. What will happen is that these electrons act like waves. And waves, when they come together, can either build up and form a much bigger, stronger wave, or they can destructively interfere. So you end up with two potential energy levels. You end up with something called destructive interference that's much higher in energy, and that's called our anti-bonding molecular orbital. And then you end up with two waves that actually build on one another, and that's constructive interference. And so in this case, where are these two electrons going to go? The upper or lower one? Lower. lower, because it's lower energy, right? So in this case, they'll be spin paired into this bonding molecular orbital. The one above it is called our anti-bonding molecular orbital. And if you excite this hydrogen with enough energy, you can actually kick these electrons up to the anti-bonding molecular orbital, but it takes a large amount of energy for that to occur. So let me actually slide these over and we'll try to take a look at what these orbitals look like through space. I'm going to slide this over. So our bonding molecular orbital, if we have our two hydrogen atoms bonded, is just these two s orbitals essentially smushed together into one big long hot dog shape. So if we look at this one, it was a sphere. This one was a sphere. Now we've got two spheres kind of mushed together. Our anti-bonding molecular orbital looks a little bit different. Let me slide this over. So we still have these two hydrogen atoms, but there's a probability of destructive interference. And what happens is you get one side with a positive phase, and you get the other side with the opposite phase. What do we call that center point where you have no probability of electrons? A node. So with these bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals, if you see a phase flip or even a point where there's no probability of electrons, that's called a node. And we'll get into that more detail when we start covering conjugated molecules. This is a really simplistic example. The reality is that nothing in chemistry is simple, right? <laughs> you guys are sure are aware of that. So when we get into more complicated examples, we have to use more complicated systems for uh, explaining what's going on. Yeah? How do you know if it's going to be bonding or So if we had energy applied to this system, we could kick up those electrons into the anti-bonding orbital, but electrons always want to reside in the lowest energy orbital. If we have more electrons in the system, there are some weird cases where you can get electrons going into the anti-bonding orbital. That's a good question, though. So let's look at a more difficult case. So in some or most cases, orbitals will hybridize. So that pairing can occur. All right, so let's take an example where it's not so simple. And again, I'm going back to our methane example. So we've got CH4. We know that the Lewis structure for CH4 is that tetrahedral shape. But let's try to explain this using molecular orbitals. So what I'm going to do is draw our energy diagram for carbon, our central atom. And so we've got our 1s orbital down here. We've got our 2s up here. And then we've got our p orbitals up here. So I'm going to label this just 2p, 2p, 2p. And we said if we fill these up, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We've got two unpaired electrons on the carbon. But we have to bond to four hydrogen atoms. There's no way to bond to four hydrogen atoms if we only have two unpaired electrons. 
So that's where hybridization comes into play. We need to come up with four unpaired electrons. So what we do is we're going to take these, these orbitals up here, and we're going to kind of mush them together into a hybrid set. So I'm going to draw hybridize, and again, we're still going to have the same energy landscape, and the 1s orbital remains untouched, but now we're going to have four orbitals of equal energy kind of in between that 1 or the 2s energy level and the 2p energy level. And so what we call this sp3, right? So we're taking 1s orbital, 3p orbitals, we're just going to label these sp3. Let me just do this on the side. I don't want to write it four times. All right, so now if we go ahead and we start filling these orbitals, we still have six electrons. We go one, two, three, four, five, six. So now we've got four unpaired electrons that can bond to four different hydrogen atoms. That's a good question. What are you saying? Why don't we take this one too? If we did this and we put it out there, it would actually destabilize the system. This is the lowest energy way of creating four spin unpaired electrons. So you always start out with the highest set. And we're familiar with the Lewis structure, so we know there has to be four different ways of bonding types. Pushing those groups together, we've got one, two, three, four electrons that can bond now. In this one, we would only have two. Okay, and how do you know it's SP3? Um, so in this case, we've got S and then three Ps that we mush together in one equivalent set. We'll get into SP2 and SP, and you'll see how those vary slightly. In those cases, we're not going to use all of the P orbitals. We're only going to use some of them. Oh, yeah, in this case, you can label it 2sp3, but with carbon, we always know that's going to be the case, so most people just write sp3. Was there a question in the back, too? No? Okay, so let's just make a quick note under here. This one only had two spin unpaired electrons, which means that it can't bond to four hydrogens. This one has four spin unpaired electrons. and can bind four hydrogens. So one important thing to look at is this sp3 orbital is a little bit higher energy than that 2s orbital, but it's a little bit lower energy than those 2p orbitals. It's just kind of the average energy between all three of those. So the question is, what the heck does this orbital look like? And that's a tricky question, but we have to actually go back and look at our orbitals. So what does a hybrid orbital look like? So what shape is an S orbital? It's a sphere, right? And we've got one of those. So what we're going to do is kind of turn this into a, an art slash math problem, right? Are you guys done with the blue writing? OK. So if we've got our S orbital, So we've got that. That looks like a sphere. And then we're going to mush this with three p orbitals. 
What shape does a p orbital have? Yeah, it's a dumbbell, right? So in this case, I'm just going to put three times a dumbbell. And it's important to remember that this dumbbell has an opposite phase, right? So one half of it is a positive node, the other half is the negative node. They're just opposite signs. And in the center, we've got that node where there's not much electron density. So we're taking this sphere shape and combining it with three of these dumbbells in order to form a hybrid orbital. And so you guys can't make fun of my drawings. This is going to have a really big bulbous -y end and then a little nubbin on the other side. Let me try to fix this. There we go. It kind of looks like a little balloon, right? So you know on a balloon you've got that little dimple on the end. This is what a hybrid orbital looks like. Eh, that's, that's decent enough. I'll, I'll accept my artwork there. Uh, this is our sp3 orbital. And if we look at this, it has 75% p character. It's obviously not a sphere anymore. It's a little bit more oblong, or it should be if I'm a good artist. And then it's got 25% s character. All right, so I think that's where we're going to stop today. Um, when we come back tomorrow, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at sp2 orbitals and sp orbitals. Um, on the problem of the day, the second problem is a little bit more challenging. Um, see if you can tackle it. Um, try talking with your neighbors and your friends, and you can even use your book as a guide. Um, try to read ahead a little bit if you can.